The opposite of being shamed is being honored. Usually. But Paul was a very unusual person, wasn't he? Christians ought to be very unusual people. For Paul, the opposite of shame was not that I might be shamed, but that Christ might be honored. It is my eager expectation and hope that I might in nothing be put to shame, but with all boldness, Christ might be magnified in my body. What you love determines what you will feel shame about. If you love for men to think highly of you, you will feel horrible shame when they don't. If you love for men to think highly of Christ, you will feel shame when they belittle him on your account. But Paul loved Christ. He loved Christ like very few people have ever loved him. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Whenever something is of tremendous value to you, whenever you cherish something because of its uniqueness or its power or its beauty, there is an inevitable longing that you draw others' attention to it so that they can share your high regard for it. And that's why Paul's all-consuming goal in life was that people magnify Christ because Christ was of infinite value to Paul. He wanted other people very much to appreciate and magnify Christ with him. That's what it means to magnify Christ, to show the magnitude of his value. Christ died for my sins is shorthand for the only way to have God 100% on my side is to receive, rest in, as a gift, who Christ is and what he did for me, not who I am and what I did for him. That's the heart of the gospel. And it's resting there where discipline can come from and resistance to legalistic discipline can come from. And whether it comes from there makes all the difference as to whether we're operating in the freedom of the gospel. Now here's, here's a biblical basis for that statement about the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him to be sin. God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin. That in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God takes our sin and imputes it to Christ. And God takes Christ's righteousness and imputes it to us. This is 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of the most glorious verses in the Bible for getting at the heart of the gospel. This grand exchange. My sins go on him. His righteousness goes on me. And because of that and that alone, am I 100% acceptable. He is 100%, not 99.9% on my side. He is 100% on my side on one basis alone. Who Christ is and what he did for me. I get in on that by childlike, yes, yes, I will have that. Receiving Him, my Lord, my Savior, my treasure, I take Him. If that's the deal, yes. But if we say, oh, I think I want to provide a little bit of righteousness on my own. I'm going to pray. Or I'm going to resist all that legalistic prayer stuff. And that'll count. That'll be the 1%. The 0.1%. 
And he'll finish being on my side now. I get him, get him totally on my side by doing some stuff. Good stuff. And that's called self-righteousness. It's all of Christ. The basis is all of Christ. Praying is overflow from that confidence. Or resisting legalistic praying is overflow from that confidence.